April fall. <laughs> My name is Stacy Wilson, and I'm the curator of exhibitions here at the MAC, and I am very excited to introduce one of our greatest friends, Felder Rushing, known as the Gestalt Gardener. He's going to come and talk to us about planting, planting in the winter. Without further ado, here's Felder. I'm going to leave the red. It's on? Okay, great. Next Wednesday, State Fair opens. Halfway through the State Fair, it goes from hot to cold. It happens every year. Mark your calendar. And uh, with the change of the seasons, we're going to be always thinking about what are we doing in our gardens. At least I do anyway. But what I want to do is kick around some ideas and show you all some astounding things that you can use in your garden to make it look as good in the middle of the winter as it does in the summertime and the springtime. And uh, just trust me on this. First of all, I want to start out with the fact that a garden is a guarded area. It's a, that's where the word comes from, a special place, an enclosure. G garden came from an old English word, gordos, which became guarded or garden or hortos and horticulture and courtyard. So a special place. So whether it's your yard or your town or your, your whatever, if you don't feel like you're in a special place, you're not really a garden. And what we do is we take this guarded concept and we turn it into, push this thing, and then we turn it into something that suits us, okay? We gussy it up. That's all we're doing. We're gu gussying up our little special place. And there's some things you can do to make it interesting. I want to point out, though, that right under our noses has been something going on for a long time. McDonald's looks good 52 weeks out of the year. They always have something that looks good. Or they don't have... They don't have maintenance, they don't spray, they don't do a lot of watering. They always, no matter where you are in the world, Japan, England, Seattle, Meridian, anywhere you go in the world, McDonald's always looks good all the time because they choose plants that look good all the time without a bunch of maintenance. This is up in the mountains of Vermont. But it, and this is uh, just before wintertime, but that's what it looks like all the time. You can have a garden that looks like that too without just a bunch of green meatballs and gumdrop type, type things. Uh, I, I, I write for a living. I travel a lot. I've, I've lectured from, from New Hampshire to West Texas in the past two weeks. I live in England part of the year. And one of the things that I enjoy doing is just kicking around ideas that make sense wherever you live. This is the little village I live uh, in England. This is about half a mile from, from my little town. Uh, that, that pub has been a pub since before we had a country. Give you an idea. See, and what in, in England, they've done stuff for so long, they figured out what works. They're not still making stuff up. They can't go to Home Depot and buy stuff that came off a truck from Florida. They grow stuff that's from that little island that does well, and they've worked it out for so long that they know what works well without a whole bunch of care. You know, we're still experimenting. We're going to make things work. We're going to grow lemon trees. You know, we're going to grow Florida bananas. We're going to grow peonies from up north. England will fit inside Mississippi. It's that small. And they've got five botanic gardens, royal botanic gardens that are world class. So people go all the time to see what does well in England. And the garden centers not only sell those, but all the garden centers have got display gardens, big yards you can walk around and see what these plants look like. We don't do that here. You know, we just sort of make stuff up. So anyway, I want to kick around a couple of ideas. I do work with, uh, with horticulture over there. This is me with my hair tied back, helping judge a, a, a little village hanging basket competition. You know, they all do this because they don't have a lot more to do. You know, they can't just drive to Atlanta. Atlanta is Germany to them. You know, it's just a little tiny place and spend a lot of time gussing each other's uh, places up. Uh, when I walk around the countryside, I see wild lupins. Now, have y'all seen lupins like this around here? No. But at the same time, well, they have wild lupins. We have wild goldenrod, which they don't plant lupins in their gardens because it's just a weed. They plant goldenrod in every one of their gardens because it's such an incredible, tough, low-maintenance, good cut flower type of excellent plant. We don't plant it because it's just a common weed. And I'm going to show you a few ideas around that. I, I travel a lot around the island. I've been to Stonehenge at the winter solstice. That's what, it was built for that. That was the reason for the season back then. Matter of fact, I met the king of the Druids, a guy named Pendergast, the king of the Druids. And guess what? He looked just like me. <laughs> I'm not making this up. I, I look like a, an old Druid, but that's okay. 
Anyway, when I, when I go around, I, I see borders like this, flower borders where they have tall stuff in the back and little stuff in the front and all this, you know, that classic English type of, of, of border, which we can have too. But I see ideas over there. I see stumperies. Have y'all ever heard of a stumpery? Okay, you know a rock garden, a bunch of different kind of rocks. A stump garden is a, st a stumpery is a collection of stump. This is in my backyard. It's an area that's too shady to, to grow anything. So I just pile stumps up. I drag them home, put them out there. Because in the wintertime, uh, and this is in the middle of the winter, it still looks pretty good. In the summertime, I've got ferns and hostas and all sorts of stuff. But the stumpery carries it through all those seasons. And this is the kind of stuff I see out there. I put a little log out there, enjoy the mosses and the lichens. It's just a little, my version of African violets, except I don't have to water them all the time. See, so it's little details like that that, that make my garden interesting. Uh, this past summer, I was privileged to be the first and maybe the only so far because of COVID uh, American journalist to cover the opening of the brand new Royal Horticulture Society garden called Bridgewater. Bridgewater just opened up, first one in 75 years. And the reason I wanted to show this picture is not because it's an old castle looking thing, but every plant in this picture, every single one, is native to Mississippi. They use our plants in interesting combinations, big bowl stuff, every one of these. Uh, and you'd ride around and you can see these things. I've seen weird pruning stuff out there. You know, you know, I don't even cut my hair, but I'm thinking, this looks okay. You know, and by the way, this, this uh, uh, topiary garden has been looking like that since the 1600s. This is one of the, one of the second oldest topiary gardens on earth. Does that look okay to y'all? I mean, you might not want to do it, but is it horticultural? Is it okay to do that? Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's a little bizarre. What about this? This is in a Japanese garden. A little poodle thing. That's okay, right? You can get your head wrapped around that. Is that natural to do that? No. But is, does it hurt the plant? No. So if, whether you like it or not, is it okay to do that? Well, the reason I'm asking because this is another Japanese garden. I want to point this out, that both this and this are Yopan hollies native to Mississippi in a Japanese Shinto temple garden because they like our stuff. It's plain old Yopan like grows along the interstate. But they pruned it up. It's not natural, but it looks okay, right? The reason I'm asking that, it, oh, I did one in my yard. My neighbors cut my yopon back so I, I, and because they couldn't get their moving thing in there. So I said, whatever, instead of cutting it down, I'll make it to a big old poodle. It's sort of like I'm poking the eye to them. Got Mardi Gras beads on it right now. But I see stuff like this in the wintertime over there. And what's interesting is this plant right here, back in the back, is a different variety, but it's the same plant as this. And they cut them back in the summertime so that all that new growth comes up. It's nice and red in the wintertime. They cut them to the ground, and the plants come back out, just like trying to get rid of an old crepe myrtle tree. It keeps coming back. Doesn't hurt the plant. It's a horticultural trick. The reason I mention that, because they also do them sometimes up on sticks. They cut it like this. They cut it back and do that. Now, that looks an awful lot like crepe murder, doesn't it? But this has been done in England for 700 years. We have tapestries with this done for 700 years. It's a horticultural trick called coppice, uh, excuse me, uh, backing it up. Cutting things to the ground, let them sprout back out, is called coppicing. That's how they grow fence posts. To cut them back a little bit high, it's called pollarding. And now they don't just do it because it's funny looking. They do it because, have you ever seen woven fences? That's where they get it. They cut some plants to the ground and every three or four years, they cut them down. They got these uniform fence posts. And then they cut some back every year to get the weaving stuff. Coppicing and parlating is how they grew fences before chain link fence. It's a horticultural thing. Okay? And the reason I'm mentioning all this, because you see stuff like this around English gardens. Those trees have been pruned back for probably 80 years. Is it pretty? No. But you know why they're doing it now, and it makes more sense, and we know it doesn't hurt the plant. The reason I'm mentioning that is because here's a picture of me holding the oldest crepe myrtle in North America, planted in the 1780s at Middleton Place in South Carolina. The oldest crepe myrtle in North America, documented. I like crepe myrtles. I love them. They're terrific plants. Uh, and there's a right way to prune them. They get too big. You know, you sort of uh, uh, shape them up, 
thin them out. You know, you don't just cut them way back. But see, that is a good way to prune an overgrown crepe myrtle horticulturally. And by the way, I've taught the tree surgery course in Mississippi State. On the other hand, you see something like this, again, in a Japanese temple. This, uh, this crepe myrtle has been pruned for probably 250 years. They do it all, it's called fist pruning. Like the other thing is called floating clouds. This is called fist pruning, and it's been done forever as an art form. You know, topiary? Topiary is just shaping stuff up. This is just topiary. We don't like it for one reason, because a guy named Steve Bender from Southern Living Magazine made up a term called crepe murder. Made it up. I was there when he did it. It was after a lecture. We were drinking at a bar. He was drinking gin, and it came out of him as a joke. And people have taken it seriously. You can prune every plant on earth, and when you touch a crepe myrtle, you're a bad person because of Steve Bender at Southern Living, a taste man. Now, you don't have to like it, but I want, want, want to point this out. This is a crepe myrtle that has not been pruned. Here's one that's been pruned back every year. Guess what? The, by the way, this has been pruned this way since 1918, 103 years. This is at the headquarters in Alexandria, Virginia of the American Horticulture Society, of which I'm a board member. American Horticulture Society has been doing this for over a century and they're not tasteless, they're not stupid, they're not ignorant. It is a style that's been well accepted worldwide, except in the South, when you do it on crepe myrtle. And they do this partly because it's interesting looking in, this, in the wintertime, okay? Now, you don't like it, don't do it. But it's, a, it's an art form is what I'm saying, and it provides those weaving things if you want them, or kindling wood for your fire, it's just a style. And the reason I'm mentioning all this, because in the wintertime it's interesting, here's my point. It's like rolling your toilet paper towards or away from the wall. Nobody's going to change your mind. But the people who say, you should not prune your crepe myrtles, what they're saying is, I don't prefer it, I won't do it in my garden. But when they say, you shouldn't, they become the kind of person who will come to your house at a party and go to the bathroom and turn your toilet paper around because they don't approve of you. Okay, you roll the way you want. If other people want to roll a different way, it's okay. That's wrong. <laughs> What's that? I said that's wrong. No, that's in my bathroom. <laughs> Actually, it goes over. And if you look at the original patent, <laughs> the original patent for toilet paper rollers is very clearly goes over. Yeah, but it like well, it ain't. Bottom line is, don't do it if you don't like it, but when you say you shouldn't do it, it's like you telling me to cut my hair. My hair is the same length and the same color as a guy on a $100 bill. Ben Franklin had hair just like this. It's all right. You know, I shave, I know what to do, but it's just a style thing, and it looks good in the wintertime. So back, back, to, uh, back to plants. This, I took this picture of the bridge, uh, Bridgewater. All of these plants in this British garden, every single one of them are native to Lauderdale County, Mississippi. They just pull them together in interesting composition. They take little random things out there and they pull them together and they give them a little fertilizer, they divide them, they put them in mass and they repeat them and it looks like a real garden. Even though these things, you know, if you go out there in the summertime, you find this stuff growing in ditches, liatris. And this is plain old phlox and uh, purple coneflower and joe pie weed. They're just individual plants out there that have a lot of benefits, they're pretty, they're good for pollinators. And what they've done here is they've taken those different plants and pulled them together in one spot. See, that's the idea of the gardens. Uh, so right now we're having fall. Trees are starting to drop their leaves, they're starting to look kind of bad, they're, they're, the green is fading away, they're starting to show their underlying colors. And so we know there's a transition. And sometimes we see it as a transition between summer and winter instead of just enjoying it as a season on its own. You know, if you look around and see great looking plants right now and put them together, you could say, I've got an autumn garden. I have a spring garden with azaleas and forsythia. I have a summer garden with roses and, and, uh, and crepe myrtles and, and uh, uh, daylilies. You can have an autumn garden with our sumacs and our, our, our sasanclas, all these things. You can have a garden specifically designed for that season. Most of it's just designed for springtime, azalea time you know, which is, is fine. But then the rest of the year, eh, 
in England, they're out there all the time, every single week enjoying their garden. So with winter time coming, uh, here's something I did in my little back garden, by the way. You know where those came from? Any idea? My neighbor's crepe myrtle. I don't have a crepe myrtle. <laughs> you know, if I want to see an azalea or a crepe myrtle, I just look across the street, let somebody else fuss with them. You know, I just, it's called a borrowed view. And when they, they cut theirs down, I go out there and I get my little weaving stuff for my fences. By the way, it's called wattle, W-A-T-T-L-E, wattle fencing. It's called woven stuff. But uh, this little homemade bird bath I made, and I uh, got a camellia, and I've got a few little plants coming up, but this is, this is going to look just like this pretty well through the fall and the winter. When you have hostas, they look great in the summertime. They're terrific, but what do you do in the wintertime when the hostas are gone? You know, you need to have something out there. That's what that old, uh, uh, you know, a bird bath will do. It. The bench helps out. Uh, we see things like this, a hostas society in Memphis, Tennessee. Memphis Hosta Society. I'm giving a lecture to them in three weeks. This is what their garden looks like in the wintertime. <laughs> Instead of just bare dirt. I think it's better than nothing. Matter of fact, I stole the idea. I've got these in my little garden, little area of my yard, and it looks kind of interesting. There's nothing planted there. It's just, it's just plant labels. <laughs> but it looks intriguing. It tells a story. It hints that there's something going on out there. And this is a lot of uh, the bells and whistles to do with gardening. I grow herbs in, a, in, a, in an old, my, my grandma's old wash, uh, wash tub, you know, she had this before she had running water. It has a hole in it now, so she threw it up under the porch. And I got it out and plant stuff in it because it's just a vessel. But the trouble is, that's what it looks like in the summer. Here's what it looks like in the wintertime. Not so great. See, so I need to get me a little gnome or something to put there. You know, a little gnome or something. You know, or maybe some, some, some sticks painted. You get the idea. Something to carry through the wintertime. Uh, here's a, a flower pot made out of a tire that's been stenciled. Can y'all see the stencil at the bottom? This is in a herb garden in, uh, uh, in uh, northern Pennsylvania. This is what it looks like in the summertime. It looks okay, but in the wintertime, the tire's still there. You know? Is it a great thing, a tire planter? No, it's recycled, so is a whiskey barrel. It's okay to plant stuff in whiskey barrels, but you can't plant stuff in a tire because that's a whiskey barrel tire. They're just vessels. Uh, this is what my yard looks like uh, back in January. Remember January, we had that little cold spell? My, this is my house looking from the street towards the, from the house towards the street. Uh, my garden is designed backwards. And I've got stuff to look at all the time, even in the dead of winter, because I choose plants that are interesting shapes and sizes and uh, little glass objects in my fire pit, my waterfall, and all like that, because I'm out there all the time. This is sumac, by the way, that's just right now, it's just starting to get good fall colors here in Lauderdale County. This is what my truck looked like last January. The same truck that's parked out here right now. I didn't pull it in the driveway, I mean, because I don't have a driveway. I didn't cover it up in the summertime because I don't, you know, I'm gone. It, this is what the garden looks like in the, in the wintertime. You can see what it looks like in the summertime, and it has not been watered a single time since, since uh, except for rain. See, so you can choose plants that look good all the time, even in difficult times. You can even do your lawn different. You can lower the wheels on one side and raise them on the other side and mow your grass differently. Now, why do that? Well, it's cause it's a sense of the absurd. It's a sense of humor. But if you're gonna do, if you get just flat, anybody can have flat grass. But you do something like this, the neighbors are gonna talk about you. But you know, I hate to tell you this, uh, Martha Stewart quoted me by name, and it's true that I said that it doesn't matter what you do or how you do it, your neighbor's gonna talk about you anyway. So give them something fun to talk about. Anyway, something as simple as that. In England, believe it or not, and in West Texas and in Florida and in Southern California, grass is difficult to grow. So what do they do? They use artificial turf. Now, this doesn't look like our grass because we have St. Augustine and Bermuda and, and uh, uh, Centipede, but they have the, you know, the rye grass, they the putting green type of grass. It's their grass. But this grass is so realistic that if you get real close and look at it, it's got three different colors of green and it's got brown woven into it for thatch. Give it a, it's not that old-fashioned astroturf. Well, this is an English garden in the front yard in the middle of the winter. Okay? I'm just saying. There's different approaches. 
back in Jackson, it's around the corner for me, they used to have uh, just gumdrops and meatballs all the way across the front of the house. You know, the, when they first built it, just meat. And over the years, they've gotten rid of some. They let one of them grow up. Instead of pruning it every year, they grew it into a tree. And down by the street, they put this row of stuff in, an end, in, in, in uh, Asiatic jasmine. So they've got a guarded area. They still got grass. Still show that they're okay. They still mow stuff to make them feel better. But they have a, a garden that's made up a lot of different stuff that just happens to have a little throw rug of grass. It's starting to get more interesting. And by the way, this is in the dead of winter. And everybody else is just wall-to-wall grass, little gumdrop-shaped, meatball-shaped things up, hugging the house foundation. So this is what they've done over the years. They, they just went out to the street and did stuff out there. And now, can you imagine, can, can you see this with daffodils poking up in it in the wintertime? See, so you can take all these different plants, uh, spiky stuff, roundy stuff, frilly stuff, and put them all together, a nice little com uh, composition that look good all the time. This is a friend of mine who lives downtown Fondren, uh, not very far from me, near University Medical Center. This is a rooftop garden. She gardens on top of the roof at, 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 her, at her thing. And look at it. This is where she keeps her potting soil, by the way. So she has something all the time, even in the dead of winter, she's got shapes and colors and textures and interest of plants that she pulled together a nice composition. I, I did a little garden in my backyard. This is a little, little water garden and an andean, and I, my, my, I dug all that up just because it used to be nothing but grass out here, just grass. And this is what it looked like in the wintertime. And over the years, I slowly started adding stuff, and this is what it looks like in, uh, in the wintertime now because I just added more stuff. You see the little, nand oops, the little nandina right there in the water garden. Well, there's the nandina, and there's the water garden. And this is what you can have in the middle of the winter in a small space that gives you something to look at to keep you through the wintertime. I mentioned uh, the, the British use a lot of our native plants. These are all native. Joe Pye weed, uh, Black Eyed Susan, the white bone set that's out there, goldenrod. What they do is they put a little piece of fence out there and make people think they know what they're doing. So you want to grow some of these weeds in your yard, put a little piece of fence out there. That's all it takes, a little accessory, something to let the neighbors you know what you're doing. You know, you can take any kind of, of scene and put a little piece of a fence or some kind of hard object and it looks better. That's called accessorizing. And wintertime is really important for accessorizing. Uh, in this case, they got the fence, but the benches. The crepe myrtle is nice, the grasses are nice, but you put the bench there as a sort of step in between. See, it gives you some place to sit in the summertime, but the wintertime, it's a nice composition because it just simply added something. A friend of mine named Rick Griffin lives in a gated community in Jackson. You have to, uh, have to stop. A guard opens a window. He looks at a clipboard before he opens the, the gate. Okay, now Rick has a quirky yard. He's been in Southern Living 40-something time. But in his backyard, this is what it looks like in, uh, in the, the late summer. You can see this right here. That is two posts, a third post, a mirror, and a fake thing here. That is just a mirror between two posts because it's at the back of his yard and beyond that is his neighbor's yard and he didn't want to see his neighbor so he put something out there that looks like it's part of his garden looks like it goes someplace see but in the winter time instead of looking at his neighbor and their bare yard he's got something that reflects the colors of his own garden see that's an easy trick it's called a baffle you know if you want to block if you want to block the sun from your eyes you don't have to put a whole wall out there just use your sun just put put your hand right where you want to block it and that's what a baffle is when it comes to cesarize in the winter time this is up in uh this is upstate uh i think it's in iowa might be in michigan but uh you take that away it's just what we see along the roadside just same old same old we see this all along the roadside all over the south but you put something like that out there in the winter time and all of a sudden it becomes a statement see so garden art has a has an important place now, you don't have to use anything expensive you know it doesn't have to be a naked uh, eight foot naked goddess statue you can get a million dollars worth of embellishment from a simple well-placed urn doesn't take much at all uh, you know, it could be something fun that moves in the wind. It could be something that, that looks interesting and collects sunlight and also makes sound. You know, but these are senses that we need to enjoy in our garden. Uh, how many of y'all have glass in one of your windows? A little glass collection, bathroom or kitchen window. Nobody? It's just me? Yeah. 
you know, a little mason jar with a root of sweet potato in it or something like that, you know. We do that because it, it, you know, we can't go outside all the time, but we can bring outside in and put it on a windowsill. And uh, this is sort, of, sort of like poor man's stained glass. The reason I mention it because to me, one of the best things you can put in your garden for winter, for all year long, especially in a shaded garden or in the wintertime, put something that, that, that brings in the light. We don't have a lot of light in the wintertime. You know, daylight saving time, short days and all like that. But put something in a shaded garden in the, in the wintertime, some, summertime. Wintertime, it looks good too. A little bottle tree. It's a real simple thing. Some people don't like bottle trees. I totally get it. But all we're doing with bottle trees is holding glass up to the sky so its colors can sing. That's all we're doing. We're just we're bringing a little light in there. It's what we call poor man's stained glass. Uh, in late, late in the afternoon, a bottle tree is a magical thing. It's magical. And in the wintertime, that same thing, it looked like that. See? It may not be what you want to do. You know, you may be a naked goddess kind of person, you know, a statue type of person. You may be contemporary or classical or something, but having something out there that goes with the seasons is kind of interesting. Here's one of my bottle trees. This is what it looks like in the summertime. Later in the summer is a tomato steak, and in the wintertime, oh, excuse me, I had this uh, to one side. I, I, I didn't want to have a, just a bottle tree, so I made all these things, and uh, never mind. This is what my bottle tree looked like back in, in uh, last January. I don't have to bend over to lick that stuff. And it's colorful when there's nothing, when my neighbors have nothing but wall-to-wall -wall grass and gumdrops and meatballs up by their house. I got stuff like this out there. And you don't have to go with blue. I think green looks fine. It disappears in the summertime and the wintertime. It's, it's not like poking your neighbors in the eye. You can go with just clear or clear and green or just green. And it looks more interesting than what we think of that bottle tree crazy. Any of y'all have a bottle tree by any chance? Okay. And, and we're, we're okay. We're okay people. I mean, you know. But anyway, it's just a little color in the wintertime when there's not much else out there. And you can get away with bottle trees in the south because they're a southern thing. I, I don't have a picture of it, but I took a picture of a bottle tree, two bottle trees actually, in northern uh, New Hampshire, 35 miles from the Canadian border last week. They're not just a southern thing. Uh, you know, having bird baths out, uh, bird houses out there, any kind of accessory is going to really help. You can over-accessorize. <laughs> you can over-accessorize. And, and if you like this, you're okay. You're okay. I wrote about people like that in a book called Maverick Gardeners, about people of color outside the line. Um, they do it so much... They're so far out there, it's like the bell curve. They stretch the, the bell curve so far out there that no matter what we do, as long as they're out there, we're okay. See, so you can do stuff as long as you're not like that. See what I'm saying? I'm just saying. I've had my grandmother's concrete chicken. You got it right here. I carried granny's chicken all over the broker tail yesterday. Got to glue it back on. I, I talked to her. It was a present to my grandmother from my grandfather for an anniversary. 70 something, I think 73 years ago. That's all he could afford. And she put it out in her yard. And one time I caught her looking out the window in the wintertime and she grew zinnias around it. And I said, Granny, what's up? She said, I'm thinking about my zinnias. I don't know if she was thinking about next year's zinnias or last year's zinnias. But she's looking out in the wintertime. She saw this, this chicken out there. In her mind and her heart, she saw zinnias. So when she passed away, when she died, they were dividing up all of her stuff. Who, who wants that old car? What are we going to do with the shift robe? Her little elephant collection. You know, she had, everybody's got a little figurine collection. I went out and stole her chicken. And I put it in my yard. And every time I look at it, I hear people say, he's got a chicken in his yard. He's a horticulturist. He's been in Southern living, blah, 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 blah. He's got a chicken. They don't understand. That is more appropriate in my little cottage garden than any other statue I could put out there. When I look at it, I don't see a concrete chicken. I see my grandmother and her zinnias, even in the wintertime. I also have flamingos. Yeah, I've got flamingos. Somebody said, uh, somebody, I, I, the, the, the man who patented them in 1957, a guy named Don Featherstone from Lemister, Massachusetts, he was an art school graduate. His first job out of school was working at Union Products. He designed the first ever pink plastic flamingo. And if you look at them real close, real Featherstone flamingos will have incredible detail, nice little egg. They're not that thing with the big eyes and the, you know, they're very elegantly done. I said, why did you do it? He said, 1957, Felder, think about this. Before plastic, 
only rich people could afford poor taste. So he, may, he, he took it to the masses. Anyway, you see, I've also got a gazing ball out there because it gives me a little color in the, in the wintertime. I also stacked up some tires. <laughs> Probably the only thing, not the only thing, the, the most vocal thing my neighbors had about my garden. You got tires. Well, I, I, you can see, I spray painted it different colors. There's two different greens and a blue. I tried to make it as real looking as possible. And I put little rocks on top of my, my, my fence post. And I thought it looked pretty good. The neighbor said, we don't like it. You're crazy, Felder. Okay. I sat on aircraft carrier during Vietnam. I'll be crazy if I want to. But they said, well, we're just not sure about it. I said, okay, well, wait till Christmas time. You know? In the wintertime, that's what it looks like. So all we're talking about doing is accessorizing. You can take egg cartons, plastic styrofoam egg cartons, cut them up in a cup, put them on your yuccas. It's okay, okay? Somebody said, well, they said, I think it's tacky. And I, and I couldn't help myself. I said, you know you hang stuff out of holes in your ears. Yeah. You hang stuff out of holes in your ears. We do this stuff. We are even. So, so that's all we're doing. It's an easy thing to do. I've got a neighbor who's got one of the big agaves, the century plants. She puts wine corks on the bottom of on the ends because they'll, they'll kill you. Real quick, I want to touch about some things that, that, that we do in the wintertime, the bells and whistles of gardening. Gardening doesn't stop just because it's cool. Matter of fact, it's easier. I spend more time in my yard when it's cool and in the wintertime than doing the sermon because it's too hot to get out there. It's too hot. And see, I do stuff in the fall and the winter and the spring, and then I'm done. So I'm going to be out there all I can. Uh, I'm, I'm older. When you get white hair growing out of your ears, you can start doing stuff like getting your teenage daughter to dig holes for you. But we do a lot of digging in the fall after rain when the dirt is easier. It's hard to dig in the summertime. In the wintertime, it's really wet. But in the fall, after rain, it's like chocolate cake. So sometimes we just dig holes and cover them with mulch, and we can plant stuff in it later. See, so we do stuff uh, in the right season. Back in the summertime, I picked a bunch of figs. In the wintertime, I enjoy the harvest. See, so gardeners plan ahead. We don't just do stuff just for the day. You plan ahead. Uh, putting bird feeder out there. Easiest way in the world to, crack, to attract color and drama to your garden. Color and motion and drama. You go out there and dump some cheap seeds out. Don't get the expensive stuff. The birds don't care. Get the cheap black oil sunflower. Put it out there. Screw it back in the house. And then watch the drama as these birds start flying with each other. Sometimes you also get these kind of things. And uh, that's just part of it just part of it. I do, I, I'm not crazy about squirrels, I'm not crazy about raccoons, not crazy about possums, but I got all three in my yard, and I don't do anything about them because you just sort of relax a little bit. It's like having an irritating uncle. At a fa you just relax and enjoy it. He's going to tell bad jokes. You just, just, just relax and go with it. Uh, I burn wood. I collect wood all summer. I have uh, stacked up firewood, and I spend a lot of time in the fall and the winter out around a fire pit. It's like flickering flames. You know, we are hardwired for sitting around fires for thousands of years for comfort and security and all these reasons sitting around a fire. That's one of the reasons why, we, well, why we're so addicted to television. Think about it, flickering motion. Our brains, the, the, the wire between our eyes and our brain, they don't di differentiate between flickering flames and flickering images it's just flickering stuff we say what it, we're looking at but we're so used to that flickering fly, fire we stare at a television because we're just used to that kind of comfort it's kind of weird by the way i was poking with the fire one night making you know how guys do and uh, a friend of mine said i think i've got something figured out for thousands of years you guys have been messing with the fire is the reason you can't leave a remote control alone <laughs> Might be, don't know. Uh, also, I, this is the time of year when I make Christmas ornaments. This is sweet gum balls and toothpicks and white glue and glitter. I make all, because I was raised that way. We made our own Christmas ornaments, and I leave them up all year long. It looks sort of like a COVID thing, doesn't it? <laughs> but, uh, but uh, you know, I, I do a lot of stuff in the fall and wintertime. It's craft-type stuff because you, you got time. It's too dark to do much. I spend time taking care of my tools, getting them ready for, for the next year. I do a little pruning out there, neaten stuff up. I adjust my night lighting. 
Because, you know, when daylight saving time hits next month, it's going to be dark at 5 o'clock. And when I get home, you know, you, you got to do stuff. So I have night lighting all over my garden because it helps me. In low voltage, I did it myself. It's like putting together an electric train set. It's not hard. To, you need a tra little low voltage transformer. You run a wire out there. You just clip lights on wherever you want them. It's that hard. And you can take the wires. And they won't shock you. It's like an electric train. It won't shock you. So, you know, and you can, you know, so you can have even the lightning can be interesting looking in the wintertime. See, so we just, we don't think about stuff. You just get the kit. No, don't get a kit. Get the individual stuff and make it yourself. But it gets you out in the wintertime when it's dark. And at night, look at the drama of having some nightlight on, on different shaped plants in the wintertime. It's really dramatic. And all it is is I ran the wire out there. I put a little up light right there and that's it. See, so that's something to think about for the wintertime. I mentioned a baffle early, by the way. This is another idea. If you got something you don't like to see, you don't have to put a whole fence up. You can put just that and you can't see the neighbors across the street. It's called a baffle. And in the wintertime when all the trees drop their leaves, you can see the neighbors and they can see you. This is an interesting, easy, simple idea. And it doesn't even have to go all the way to the ground. You could have it where it goes from here down to there. Or where the neighbors are, you could have it from here to here. Just enough to block the sun. See, so that's something to do in the wintertime when we have a lot more views is use an opportunity to sort of make our place more secure, the more of a guarded area. A lot of times I have plants that won't make it through the wintertime and I don't want to uh, outside in a pot, but um, I don't want to plant them, so I'll bury the plants. I'll group them together and I'll cover the roots with mulch. So a lot of times I take care of my plants that way. I'm out of time. And it drives like a 1988, I'm just saying, I don't know how country you are. I started me a little garden last year. This is what it looked like in the middle of the winter, or late, late winter. Uh, I do this to keep the possums and the raccoons out. But all of these kind of things I plant in the fall because they look good in the wintertime. Right now it's, it's tomatoes and peppers. It's got some beans. It's got zinnias and stuff. But in the wintertime, if you've got a little raised bed, you can do a little small area and have something to enjoy to look at and eat all the time oh yeah my house is painted lavender with pumpkin trim because i told my daughter when she was 14 she could choose the colors and when she chose those i'm thinking i could say no or i could just love her and let her do that thing luckily it's time to be repainted i'm not going to ask her advice this time <laughs> uh, i also sow stuff in the in the winter time for cover clover and stuff you put clover out there in the winter time it grows all winter it absorbs nutrients from the air. It breaks up the dirt with the roots in the springtime. You cut it down, you turn it under, and it's better than anything you can buy. It's called a cover crop. And you can do that in any kind of garden. Just, you know, that's just turnips. But uh, turnips and clover over the... Is that a four-leaf clover right there? I'm not sure. Anyway, cover crops planted right now will grow all winter long and build your dirt up. And all you got to do is cut it, let it dry, and all the roots... And all the tops, working the dirt is un unbelievable. Uh, sometimes I have to cover stuff up with frost to keep insects off of it. Uh, I want to do this sometime. This is Colonial Williamsburg. They used to have winter gardens. They would protect them with these south-facing things. There. They're called uh, cold frames. And look how they did the, the woven fence with hay around it to insulate it. See? That's real cute looking when you see it, but when you find out they do crate murder to get it, all of a sudden you don't respect them anymore. They're bad people. Uh, you can cover up individual plants uh, if, if you need to. If it's going to frost, that little plant, you just slip it over there for the night. You can do that with the milk jug. See, so there's little horticultural things you can do. This is my little garden out by the street. I've got a raised bed thing with my herbs, and I put uh, rebar in there. And all I do is I just cover it with a tent if it's going to freeze, and I cover it the next day. See, so anyway, there's ways you can modify the environment just a little bit. You can make your own if you want to. But you get the idea on that. By the way, nobody's seen this picture before. Look at there, February 1975. This is the first greenhouse I ever built. And it's only about this tall. I had to get on my hands and knees to get in there. 
I can do better now, but I started small. In the wintertime, I root stuff. You know, Confederate roses are blooming right now. This time to make cuttings. You put them in a bucket of water, they grow all winter long, you got plenty to share with your neighbors. So I root stuff in the wintertime too. Uh, I root uh, fig trees. I stick them between my violas, figs and roses. I just stick them in between my flowers. And by springtime, it's time to dig the flowers up. The, the cuttings are rooted, see? So there's lots of easy things you can do in the wintertime we just don't think about. Master Gardeners in Jackson have a rose rooting seminar every year in the middle of the winter in a cemetery to show people how to, row, how to root America's floral emblem in the wintertime, see? So wintertime is not a downtime. It's what Dr. Dirt used to do, just stick cuttings in plain old dirt and he grew roses. Speaking of dirt, he, uh, he also made his own dirt uh, I like to rake leaves and blow leaves and all, but I don't put them in bags for the neighbors to haul off. The neighbors being the city, meaning I'm paying them to haul stuff off. What I do is I pile it up. I have two piles. I pile stuff up in one bin. When it's full, I start piling the other. When it's full, the first one start, is already ready to dig. So I just fill one up, dig out the other. When it's empty, I fill it up. I'm digging out the other, back and forth. I don't turn it. I don't air it. I don't do any of that composting stuff thermophilic bacteria and carbon nitrogen ratio. I don't do that stuff. I can tell you, I can make your eyes bleed with stupid detail about stuff you need to do to be a composter. I could bore you to make your ears bleed. But the truth is, pile it up and one, when it's full, you're digging out of the other. When it's empty, start just back and forth. You don't have to turn it, you don't have to do all that stuff. It's called a leaf pile. Here's the two rules for composting, which we do over the winter time. Any questions? Can you, can you speed it up? Yeah. Are you in a race? No. I, I made compost start to finish in three weeks flat one time. Rodell Press, the organic gardening people, gave me a little pin because I did it in three weeks and I worked myself to death and nobody cared. It's just compost. You can buy it for a dollar. So that's the rule. You can just have a leaf pile, just a place to blow leaves. And if your neighbors complain, put a sign out there. Just put, a, just put a sign out there. Let neighbors know you're doing this on purpose. They can just shut up. So, I want to look at some plants. But I want to mention this. When it comes to digging and enjoying our garden, this is a guy named Dr. Dirt. I featured him in this book, Maverick Gardens. The book started out as a book about him. He turned, ended up, come to find out, he just represents a lot of people who've gardened in excess who love to share, love to garden, love to share all year long. When he used to come to my radio, he, he, he's my co-host for four years. Uh, he passed away about four years ago. Uh, he, had, he would come in every week for four years with a bouquet of flowers every week of the year that he cut from his garden that morning. Every week of the year for four years. I've got pictures of dozens and dozens of his bouquets from his yard. This is in late winter. You can see the... Uh, the, uh, the magnolias and the nandina berries and the, for the, those plants every week of the year because he planted stuff to have stuff out there every week of the year. Uh, by the way, this is what his, his garden looks like in the wintertime. He had all sorts of colorful stuff and shapes and all, but he didn't have enough colors. So he took some spray paint to his grasses. And some people didn't like it. He says, you wear a mascara, shut up. So he brought color where there was none. He had an exuberance about him. Um, and incidentally, this is what his garden looked like in the, uh, this time uh, in the fall. And he passed away four or five years ago. And I went by uh, uh, earlier in the summer. And this is what his garden looks like now. Oh, by the way, see the Confederate rose and the tall native sunflower? This is what it looks like now. Yeah. Hug people while you can, especially creative people, especially kids. But gardens are ephemeral. They're ephemeral. Now, I want to mention that I've got a little PDF thing. It's a few pages long with pictures and lists and how-to and all like that about gardening in the winter for southern gardens. Uh, that's what my garden looked like uh, three years ago. If you send me an email, I'll send it to you free. It's just a little PDF. You can you print it out if you want to, but it's got a whole bunch of pages and pictures and lists of good plants. So if, uh, I would have brought some today, but didn't know many folks would be here. But if you shoot me an email, don't go to my website, because that's just for fun. Go to Felder Rushing Blog, B-L-O-G, and have a little thing that says email me. Felder Rushing Blog and say, I want your winter thing. I'll send it right back to you. It's a little, you can print it out or not, but it's probably... 
15 or 16 pages with pictures and lists of stuff. See, so I could have just done that and stopped talking, right? <laughs> anyway, now, let me, let, let's look real quick at some plants. Real quick at some plants. Just to give you an idea of what you can have in your garden in Mississippi in the wintertime. Every picture I'm about to show you, most of them are taken in Mississippi. Did it work? Yes, sir, she got it. I'd love to have seen her drive that old pickup truck of mine, my dad's old pickup truck. When my father passed away in uh, January, about uh, 15 years ago, what's that? You know those? Well, this is, uh, I'll get all horticulture on you. This is the flowers of Nandina, uh, the berries of Nandina domestica, heavenly bamboo. This is the flower of a Camellia japonica called Pink Perfection. And these are the flowers of a Narcissus Tazetta. We call them paper whites. Now, get this. He died in January. I made this bouquet from his yard that week, middle of January in Mississippi, okay? They look good in the yard. The camellia, nice big bush with the, with the, the pretty red flowers, the, the, le, the, the ferny nandina with the red berries, the little skirt of the paper white. It looked good in the yard. It looked good in a pot, in, in a vase. But get this. This was my dad's yard. Before that was his mother-in-law, Granny, the concrete chicken lady. And before that was her mother-in-law, my great-grandmother, a horticulturist, who grew over 350 different kinds of daffodils. Okay. These plants were planted before my father was born. And they've been growing for 50 years with no water, no spray, no dividing, no horticulture, no nothing for 50 years. But what we did was we pulled these different tough plants into one composition, see? And that's what we're doing. We're taking these kind of things and making a little beautiful little bouquet in the garden with things that are scattered out there. Um, you know, and you do the same thing with uh, tree trunks, evergreen ground covers, plants with spiky things. Even interesting vines look good in the wintertime. And you can plan for this. You can plan to have things that look good in the wintertime by having a fence torn out with just a simple vine. See, so you don't have to be all heroic, big Royal Horticulture Society person. You can have something as simple as, as our, our native yuccas, you know. Put the styrofoam mid cartons if you're worried about poking your eye out, but, but they give good structure and texture. They're shapes and different textures. I'll talk about texture in a second. Even the, the grasses in the wintertime look good. You can spray paint them if you want to, but a lot of people cut their grasses down without realizing that that looks kind of interesting part of the year. Uh, we have uh, plants, there's, there's a plant called fatsia. Any of you grow fatsia? Got big leaves? This is a variegated one. Fatsia grow in the shade. It must have shade. It's got a nice big coarse texture. But you can get variegated ones that look like they got snow on them. See? How about akuva? Y'all grow akuva? You know, it roots so easy that uh, you make a flower arrangement by cutting some branches and put them in your, in your flower vase. And when all the flowers die, the kuva's there, and you try to pull them out. Three weeks later, it's all rooted. They root in water. They're that easy. But in the wintertime, it's got good shapes. It's a good coarse textured plant. It's got, it got color. It's just an interesting plant. But if you take those two and put them together, it looks nice. Uh, this is my great-grandmother's um, Japanese persimmon in the wintertime. You could eat them. Well, she just liked the way they look. Japanese, by the way, that tree was 70 years old when Katrina blew it down. Uh, as far as berries, any of y'all have this in your yard or you know where that spiky wild lemon is? Y'all know about it? it? It's a rootstock. They graft citrus on it. So when you buy like a lemon tree at Home Depot, and you put it in your yard, the lemon dies, the roots sprout out and you end up with this thing with thorns on it. It's hardy outdoors in Kentucky, and it has these kind of fruit that are about the size of a golf ball. They're mostly seed. They'll turn you inside, they are so sour. But it's an interesting plant in the winter time. And uh, I'll show you what you can do with the, with the branches in a bit. Uh, our native deciduous holly drops its leaves in the winter time. Uh, our yopon holly, the weeping yopon, looks good in the, better in the winter to me than in the summertime. Uh, one of my all-time favorite plants is Nandinas because they have good shape, good texture, nice berries. Some of you may have heard that Nandinas are poisonous to birds. Have y'all heard that before? Simply not true. I'm real sure about this. The Audubon Society says it's poison. 
is not true. It's based on two cases of one type of bird called a uh, cedar waxwing. They come in in big hordes. They have an extra large craw more than any other bird. They eat more than any, and they come through after a hard winter, and they eat way too many fermented berries, and it kills them. They've got two cases, two cases documented, Meanwhile, they're saying Nandinas kill birds. Simply not true. And you can always, and by the way, if you do the research, you'll come across that. So what they're saying now is not don't plant Nandinas. They're saying snip the berries off before the the cedar wax wings come through. And I can do that. But look at this, though. You have some that turn brilliant red in the winter. The colder, the sunnier, the harsher conditions. This is what it looks like on a hot, dry, clay hillside in my front garden. This is what they look like, the little compact one. And look, there's some that only get, that's as big as it gets. It's a little ground cover called Pringle. And it fills up in the wintertime. Can you see daffodils coming through that? See, so, you know, you can take these kind of plants and find different varieties, different shapes. Seeding time, winter foliage and berries are important. Uh, anybody know what this is? Nope, not a kumquat. Mm-mm. I'll give you a hint. It starts flowering in late November and December. It's very, very fragrant in December after a freeze. You know, Eliagnus, a kind of wild thing. It has all these branches. People prune them back. By the way, it's a vine. People don't realize it's a vine. I grow one across my backyard up in the trees as a vine, evergreen vine. It smells wonderful in December. In January, it's got fruit that are about this big and they're perfectly edible. They, they taste like little pears. Who, who would make that up? Eliagnus is a fruit for the January. It tastes like little, you know, they got kind of a, ta- a, a pithy, you know, like a, you know, almost not, you got to wait till they're ripe sort of like persimmons, but they're perfectly edible in January. And if you'll look at where somebody's got one of these, and you'll walk by it, I do a lot of walking in my neighborhood, go by in December, you'll smell them. They're really, really fragrant, more than the, than the sweet olive right now. And you come back later, you can munch on them. Anyway, shapes, this is our native palmetto. By itself, it's okay, crepe myrtles is okay, but look at that combination, see? And that's what we're talking about, combination. We've got uh, our native yucca that is variegated for them. This is called bright lights. It's a little yucca. That's as big as it gets, and it looks good in the wintertime, even with other plants. In the dead of winter, it looks good. Um, you can put different uh, agaves and, and succulents in containers. The containers look good, but you put in some interesting plants. This is what it can look like in the middle of the winter. And there's some that'll take 10 below zero. This is a little compact. If you look at the back of my pickup truck, you'll find one, one of these. It's called David Eye, but it's, uh, it, it only gets about this big in the wintertime in a pot on your back porch. And then here's an even smaller one. I got a, uh, this is called uh, tricolor. It only gets about this big. It makes a ground cover. These are, are runners. It runs, it, it, matter of fact, it'll spread if you, it, but anyway, it look good in the wintertime in a pot on your porch when there's nothing else out there. And we have some incredibly winter hardy succulents. This is the dead of winter. This is in Michigan. Dead of winter outside. We've got some cool plants. Uh, here's one in Michigan. Grows outside. You've seen these. Y'all, y'all know this. Y- y'all grow this? You bring it in the wintertime? No. Well, this is just as hardy and that's just hard. You put them together and you got a cool little thing on your patio when there's nothing else out there. We just don't think about uh, things like this for, for color. You can even have fun like I do in my yard. Shrubs, y'all know Mahonia, Oregon grape holly. If you got a shady garden, it's got to have shade. It's a shade plant. And it looks like this in January, blooms in January. And it's a common plant. We just don't think about that. What about flowering quince? Blooms in January and February. Now, if you put those two together, you got yellow and red side by side. And uh, the flowering quince comes in different varieties, by the way, different colors. See, so y'all know these plants. You've seen them. We just don't think about pulling them together in composition. Here's one that'll start blooming in the dead of winter. It's called winter, uh, winter honeysuckle, big shrub. 
winter honeysuckle, a real fragrant in the middle of the winter, covered with ice, and the day warms up, pretty little day, middle of the winter, honeybees come out, it's the only thing they can get nectar from. It's a big, big plant. And then there's a magnolia called star magnolia. It's uh, about like a dogwood. It's not a big tree, but it blooms in the dead of winter, star magnolia. Y'all know these plants? Okay. How about this one? Anybody know what it is? I can't remember the name of it. It's a weird, weird name. It's a uh, paper something. Huh. I'm drawing a total blank. That's okay. I've only seen three in Mississippi. You know why? Because nobody sells it. Because it doesn't look like much in a pot. Edgeworthia. Edgeworthia. <laughs> like edgeworth -ia. But it blooms in the winter time. Why don't they sell it? Because it doesn't look good in a pot. But in the middle of the winter, when nobody's shopping at garden centers, it's out there. And all you have to do is plant like an azalea. It needs good, well-drained soil. Uh, here's a plant that is very rarely planted around here, and it grows perfectly well, is witch hazel. Witch hazel, and they come in reds, yellows. Witch we have a native witch hazel. Uh, what they did here is they pruned it when they set it out, cut it down low so it bushes, bushes out. This is the middle of winter. Witch hazel does great here. Uh, what about, I get calls all the time, is it too late to prune my hydrangeas? I'm thinking, actually they say, is it too late to prune my hydrangeum? <laughs> no, you can prune it now, but that's kind of pretty. You know, you can spray paint it. But look at this. This, is, this, is a, this shows that, that brown is a color too. By having different shapes and, and all, you can have a nice looking garden that's just brown. Now you put a little statue out there, a little bottle tree or something, and all of a sudden you got some bling. Uh, we have sasanquas that are starting to bloom just about, well, later this month. Camellia sasanqua blooms in the fall. They'll bloom past Christmas into January, see, which is nice. But then we have Camellia japonica that picks up in January and goes through March. But just two different kinds of camellias, you can have color from October until March in your garden. Uh, I want to throw this out. It's, it's, a, it's a tough plant. My great grandmother planted some uh, back in the 1930s. They still look like this all the time, no care at all. But I want to, let me, let, me, let me show you just a little bit about plant collections. Uh, there's a lot of different kinds of camellias. That's the pink perfection. That was my great grandmother's favorite. And white ones, and double ones, and pink ones, and red ones, and all that. You with me on this? With just one plant, you can choose all this. But look at this. I picked all these right during the freeze we had back in January. Walking around my neighborhood, this much variety was growing in my neighborhood and blooming in January. Is that amazing or what? So we think of camellia, you just think of Aunt Mamie's old camellia shrub. I think of this, and by the way, look at this bouquet I made with Mahonia, Forsythias, some paper whites, and a little blue vase. This is all done during that freeze in January. You can have all of this in one spot in your yard and look good. Real quick digression, y'all know Rose of Sharon or Althea? We think of the old fashioned one. This is what you can have in the middle of the summer. These are all different kinds of Rose of Sharon or Altheas. And they grow in cemeteries. Dead people can grow these. Okay, so what I'm saying, you take an old-fashioned plant, come up different varieties, and then uh, here's some of the, these are some of the roses that I grow. And I don't spray, I don't water, I don't do anything. These are some of the roses that I grow in the spring, usually the spring, and they sort of spritz along the rest of the summer. So between the camellias and then the altheas and the roses, what else can we have? How about different chrysanthemums? Y'all know this one you see around town called Country, uh, Clara Curtis? Everybody's got that old pink one that blooms in, in the January. All of these are a type of chrysanthemum that will come back for 50 years with no care at all. And they bloom in late October and November. So I've got all these different seasons, all these different kinds of plants. Uh, hellebores, y'all know about hellebores? They bloom in the winter, January, February. This one that some people call Lenten Rose. It's a shade plant. It grows perfectly well in Mississippi in the shade. This is what it looks like in some people's yards, but they've got all different kinds of it. And look at this. These are the kind of things you can have in the middle of the winter if you choose to plant hellebores and start looking for different varieties. 
options. We see all these kind of daffodils that bloom in the, usually the late February, March. Here's some that I grow in my garden. They all came from my great grandmother's yard and none of them have ever been watered or fertilized or divided into that horticulture stuff. This is what happens in my yard and they're starting to come up right now. You plant these right now, but these are the varieties that we know will do very, very well. Not all daffodils will do well. Van Zyveren Brothers sells a ton of bulbs. But there's only a few of them that are gonna be here 50 years from now. These are the ones I look for. By the way, y'all know what this is? Wait, what, let me, here it is right there. What do y'all call that? What? Everybody calls it snowdrops. Everybody calls it snowdrop. It's not, it's snowflake. Who cares? Well, notice snow, <laughs> snowdrop has got little bell-shaped flowers and little green dots, right? It grows unbelievably easy. Here is snowdrop. It's got wings and a heart. They grew up north. Snowdrops won't grow here. So anyway, you can call that snowdrops all you want because that's what everybody else calls it. Just want to let y'all know that we have snowflakes, they have snowdrops. Isn't that a stupid thing to know? <laughs> it's like knowing the difference between daffodil and narcissus. Narcissus is the Latin name for all daffodils. All daffodils are some kind of narcissus. It's just Latin. But somebody says, no, those are jonquils. No, jonquils are one of the little skinny quill leaf is shaped like a quill, John Quilla. And then they've got paper whites, they've got doubles, they've got butter and eggs, they've got all different kinds, but they're all narcissus, they're all daffodils. But Aunt Mamie's gonna argue, she's the yellow ones are daffodils, the white ones are narcissus, whatever. What about this? Naked ladies. Some people call it surprise lily, magic lily. Guess what? It comes up in the summertime, just like the red spider lilies right now. But in the middle of the winter, here's what it looks like. Middle of the winter, when there's nothing else out there, you can have that. And then in the summertime, boom, you got those flowers. See, so these are the kind of things you can plant ahead for wintertime. Who grows this? Where'd you get it? Somebody? Somebody? It's hard to find for sale, but it's in every older part of town. It comes up in the fall, it blooms in the spring, and dies down completely like it was never there. It, over the winter, is like a hosta. Matter of fact, I plant it with my hostas. I have hostas in the summertime, I have this in the wintertime, back and forth, back and forth. It's called painted arum, A-R-U-M, painted arum. It's been in the south since Thomas Jefferson grew it. Been around for a long, long time. Does it come back for you every year? It's just a great plant, painted arum. Why don't we see it for sale? Because it's not a daffodil, and they don't sell it at Van Zyveren Brothers. See, mainstream stuff is not always the best stuff, and sometimes the best stuff is hard to find. We have things that bloom uh, in, in the, the wintertime, like this old uh, white flags iris. It was introduced by the Spaniards because the roots are used as a herbal fixative called orris root. Florida Lee on the French flag is parent, but it blooms in the wintertime. Aspidistra, cast iron plant. They got variegated kinds. They've got so much spots on them, but it's a wintertime plant. Uh, evergreen holly fern. It grows in Tennessee. Needs to have shade, but this is what it looks like in the dead of winter. A fern. Monkey grass. <laughs> Plain old monkey grass. Boring old monkey grass. Oh, yeah. I grow variegated monkey grass because I like the way it looks and the way it flowers in the summer. But look, they've got silvery colored. They've got some that are golden colored that I grow in pots all the time. They've got dwarf mondo grass, a little stuff that you can walk on. Here's a, a, a neighbor, just plain old regular mondo grass, plain old monkey grass. And, and they're just around the corner from me, you see the aspidistral cast iron? But this is what they do, that, that's their walkway right there. Got moss on it. But this is what they use for a lawn monkey grass, they just mow it. People say, well, you can't get rid of it. No, I'll put it in your yard. And then I like to use combinations of them, little combinations. Anyway, to another group of plants that we have in the wintertime that a lot of people don't like is winter weeds, weeds in the lawn. You know, oxalis, can't get rid of oxalis. What if you mow it, that's what it can look like in the wintertime. You know, you can spray it if you want to, 
or you can just relax and enjoy it as a winter meadow plant. It comes up in the winter, it blooms in the spring, and when your grass starts growing, you mow your grass and, and it's gone. See, it grows in the winter time where you have a summer, you can have a summer lawn and a winter and spring meadow. You can do that. We did that before the 1940s and 50s when they started mass marketing herbicides and weed and feed and stuff. People just mowed what grows. They just mow what grows. That's what oxalis looks like if you just relax and leave it alone. Your neighbors aren't going to like it. Oh, well. And uh, things like henbit and dandelions, if you put a daffodil in there, it is a wonderful little composition. So if you've got problem with winter weeds, plant daffodils out there. You see it around country houses, right? Daffodils and then lawn. Daffodils and lawns. Why not daffodils and other stuff and then lawn? That's the approach. And a matter of fact, uh, have a little clump, clump of clover. You can mow around and leave one clump out there for the Easter egg to lay an egg in, uh, the Easter bunny. See, you can have a little bit of that kind of stuff without any trouble. Now, you remember I showed you this. Well, let me, let me mention this. In the wintertime, we can have annuals that only bloom in the winter. These grow in the summertime in England. Daffodils, I mean, uh, uh, pansies, violas grow all summer in England and in Oregon and in Vermont. But here, they die. They grow over the wintertime for us. They won't grow in the winter up there. See, so we have these kind of things. Uh, there's so many different kinds. The violas, little violas, the big pansies, the panolas. But this is my favorite, the old-fashioned Johnny Jump Up. It recedes and comes back, and it looks so good with daffodils. And in the springtime, it's time to mow the grass. You just cut it all down, and it, they, they both, the daffodils and the violas come back. This is something that is perfectly hardy in the winter for us, and they won't grow in the winter up north. It's, it's ours. Snapdragons, there's a whole bunch of annuals they sell that are kind of borderline. They don't really like cold, cold weather. They don't like hot, hot weather. Like snapdragons, we have a hard freeze like we had in January. They get killed. But they're a good gamble. There's a lot of good gamble plants. Uh, I like to grow things that are pretty to look at when you're tired of looking at it. You can eat it, like lettuce. Lettuce in a pot. Why not? Why not? And look at all the different kinds of lettuces you can grow in a pot. I, I, I spray paint my pots. So, you know, my, my gay friends, they say, Felder, you are so gay. I'm thinking, <laughs> I like to accessorize, okay? It's all right, it's okay. But anyway, different shapes and textures in buckets in the wintertime. I even put them going up my steps in pots because I think they're pretty in the wintertime when everything else is gone. I grew some in a hanging basket one time because, first of all, the, the dog can't pee on it. The snails can't get in it. You gave me a squirt bottle of vinaigrette, I don't even have to bend over to eat it. But this is something you can do in the winter time when we think that gardening is over. Uh, burgundy mustard, colorful uh, ornamental cabbages, kale, y'all know this black, this uh, really dark kale? It, it'll take 10 below zero. And look at this, here's one called Lacinata dinosaurs, what the Tuscans used for 200 years to make their minestrone. This will grow outside in the winter in Michigan. Here's what it looks like. It's a great, and it's blue, blue. So anyway, you get the idea. Crepe myrtle, everything's bare. You know, you got uh, pansies, cabbage, kale, and then something like that in a small. Uh, partially grows over the winter time. Partially grows better for us in the winter than it does in the summer. This is what it looks like in dead of winter. Garlic. I plant six different kinds of garlic. This one will light you up. It is zesty. And I plant it this time of the year. It has nice foliage in the wintertime. In the springtime, I got these things. It's just like daffodils, except when you're tired of looking at it, you can eat it. Uh, indoor plants, very quickly. I'm in my house all the time, even in the wintertime, so I have a little tropical jungle. And I grow lots of different kinds of plants. Here's one called Chinese Evergreen. It'll take low light and low humidity. Low light, low humidity. And it's colorful. It really does well indoors. Um, there's a whole bunch of, you see my Chinese Evergreen right there. Anybody know what this plant is with the carrot looking things? Y'all know mother-in-law tongue? Yeah, this is my grandmother's granny, the concrete chicken lady. She put tinfoil around hers because she said it made them pretty. That's how I was raised. 
thinking it's okay to have a concrete chicken and tinfoil. Uh, you can grow these in an ashtray on the television, okay? They're succulent. You water them once a month max. So y'all with me on this, right? What if I were to tell you that there's lots of different kinds? And if you can grow one, you can grow all of them. I have 13 different kinds, including this one down here, and that one, that one, that one, that one, that one. And they're all unkillable. So you know about unkillable plants, just a matter of getting a variety of them going. I grow succulents in my little pickup truck. You know something funny? Those are all real. These are all fake. I can't tell them apart. I got those at Hobby Lobby, but those are real, and they stay out all year long in, in my garden. What's the difference between these paper whites and those paper whites? You know paper whites, you plant them in water and gravel and they bloom, but they always get too tall and they flop over, always. Well, these are planted identical, same bulb, same bag, same gravel, same water, same, everything is identical except on this one, when I planted them, I put a little alcohol in the water. You can use, well, I, I use gin, but you can use rubbing alcohol if you got it. Just a little bit. It's like one part alcohol to seven or eight parts water. And it stunts them. They bloom exactly the same except short and, and stubby. Isn't that a stupid thing to know? You can do this in the wintertime, though. So how many of y'all think these things smell like cat pee? Some people do. Just think about it. But anyway, that's just a stupid little trick. A horticulture trick. This is alcohol. Oops. Oops. Ah, phooey. Let me see here. Let's start right back up here. Cause Let me see. I show. I'm right at the end of the, all this stuff. Okay. No alcohol, alcohol. Everything about them is identical. By the way, they say you're supposed to plant them in gravel. I didn't have any gravel. But I had some Mardi Gras beads. And that works, that works too. But that's paper whites with a little alcohol in it. Not too much alcohol, it'll kill them. Just Google it. Paper whites and alcohol. It's got Cornell University Research. And it's a stupid thing to know, ain't it? It's something kids can do. And uh, sort of wrap stuff up. I've got my violas, which are easy. I've got my painted arum, an old heirloom plant. Two different kinds of, of uh, paper whites. And I got them in one little spot. If I had a little gnome, it'd be perfect. See, so instead of just a lot of ones, I just got little vignettes I see in my garden. And there's ways you can do that. If you know the difference between big leaves and skinny leaves and middle leaves, that's called texture and shape. You mix them up. Put different kinds of plants together. It makes it look good. You can have, the, and this is not in England. This is in Greenville, South Carolina, in the middle of the winter. What's that? Yeah. Is that the shy uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm, Charlotte, North Carolina. I said Greenville because my son graduated, just graduated college there. Uh, this is Charlotte, straight down Interstate 20 in the middle of the winter. You can have something that looks like this in the wintertime. So people say, well, we can't do that. I say, England, no, this, is, this works well here. You can take different shapes and put them together. It looks good. Uh, this is a garden in my neighborhood. Uh, by the way, they got a little brown patch on their grass. They need to call me about that. But this is the middle of winter. They got different shades, Laura Petalum and, and the daffodils and, and uh, the, the Japanese um, uh, magnolias and the, the, the star bright yucca. They put them together in a nice little combination in the dead of winter. If they had a bird bath, it'd be perfect. That's all we're doing. You make your lawn smaller, you find stuff to go around the edges, and then you just tuck in a little, few little flowers here and there. Doesn't have to be expensive. This is my, I did this in my back garden. Uh, had a little area that needed a little fixing up. That's in the wintertime. Here's what it looked like to begin with. You see my little rabbit, my little wattle fence, and some rocks and painted arum, and it needed something. So what I did was I added a couple of shrubs and some flowers and turned it from that into this. It looks English, and it's in Jackson, Mississippi, by having just different shapes. And this is what it looked like back in January, when there was nothing there before but St. Augustine grass. And uh, by the way, I think this might, it's, it's not my last slide, it's my next and last slide. 
when you see these start to bloom, what do y'all call them? Tulip trees, Japanese magnolia, oriental magnolia, solanchiana, whatever you call it. We always get a little warm spell in the springtime and everything's just great. And then these things always bloom in the late winter and what happens? They cause a freeze. So these are the end, not the end of the winter. When you see these, they're not saying spring is here. They're saying winter is almost over. These are the tail end of winter. So I've shown you a, a lot of stuff. Uh, this is my great grandmother's pink perfection camellia. I rooted it. This is my great grandmother's Nandinas, I divided it. These are my great grandmother's Narcissus, the, the paper whites. I do, dug and divide them. These were planted in the 1930s, still blooming in the Delta. I moved them to my yard because that nice little combination in the middle of winter when my neighbors are moaning and groaning about how cold and there's nothing to do out there. So, and Granny's chicken. Just want to let you know that you can have a combination of plants that are all over, that are tough as nails and interesting, cutting edge, old fashioned, whatever. Pull them together in one of those combination, and you can have a garden that looks pretty good in the dead of winter. I think that's important. I think I've talked for way too long, but I just had to get it out. This is the first time I've ever given this presentation. I need to tighten it up. Probably lose the, the, the crepe myrtle stuff. <laughs> Any questions? Wore y'all out? Yes, ma'am. Oh, no, no. Uh, I've, I've been in my neighborhood for, for 37 years. You know, they moved to the nuisance. <laughs> but um, anyway, no, it's just, uh, they, they know me. I mean...